All right, welcome back, everyone. OK, so happy Halloween. Uh, I was hoping to see more people dressed up, but I guess I'm not. So that's fine. Uh, OK, so what I want to do today is talk a little bit about um, numerical integration before jumping into how to solve ODEs computationally. OK? Now, I don't want to downplay numerical integration. It's very important. Uh, it's actually like a really important thing to know how to do. I don't want to spend too much time on it because it's very similar to numerical differentiation, and this is not like a full numerical analysis class. Okay, so I'm going to hit the highlights. We're going to know how to program it and what the basic error scalings are for different methods, and that's it. So hopefully we'll get through um, this quickly and get to numerical integration of ODEs. Okay, so last time we saw, um, just like with numerical differentiation, we can take some function f of x, and we can chop it up into a bunch of finite intervals. And we can approximate the area under this curve, or the integral, using the area of all of these finite uh, rectangles. Okay? And I'm not going to um, write down the formula again, because basically you just add up all these rectangles. It's that simple. Okay? Uh, how accurate do you think this method is going to be? Really accurate, not very accurate, like what are some feelings? Really accurate? Not very accurate? No basis of comparison? Okay. Uh, so how could this rectangle rule be inaccurate? In what ways might this not be accurate? It can overshoot or undershoot. It can overshoot or undershoot. So notice here, every time my function has a positive slope. I'm undershooting. I'm not getting all of this area. There's real area there that my rectangles are missing. And for finite sized rectangles, I will never capture those. And for any time where my function has a negative slope, I'm overshooting, right? My rectangles are over predicting by this amount. So fortunately, if I have something like a sine wave, they actually cancel out. But so does all of my other integrals, so it's not, yeah, these are real errors. This is actually a very uh, problematic method for integration. So let's zoom in a little bit to one of these rectangles. So we're in this interval x to x plus delta x. We have some function that's passing through these two points. And my rectangle rule is approximating the area with this rectangular area. So right off the bat, what's the most natural or intuitive way that we could possibly uh, improve our estimate of this area? Sorry? Okay, so right now we're saying that this area is equal to f of x times delta x. This is the left rectangle. Now, I could also equally well say, OK, well, I have the same function, but what I'm going to do is approximate the entire area by this right rectangle. I could do that. And this would say my area is f of x plus delta x times delta x. This is my right rectangle. Okay, so what would I do if I wanted to get better error properties? If I didn't want to undershoot or overshoot the actual area quite so badly? Okay, I could take the average. That would be a very reasonable thing to do. And taking the average has an extremely simple geometric interpretation. Okay, so what it really means to take the average of this, so let's just say one half of this plus this equals. Okay, x, x plus delta x. So what we're really doing here is we're taking our left rectangle and we're adding to it a triangle of this height. Okay? I mean, if you, if you add up this rectangle and this rectangle, you get, let's just see what this looks like. You get our short rectangle plus our tall rectangle. But the tall rectangle has a short rectangle in it. 
So this equals two short rectangles plus this remainder, which I can chop into two triangles. Okay, so when I take one half of this sum, I get one of my short rectangles plus one of these triangles. Okay, and that's what I get here, is this trapezoid. So this is called trapezoidal integration. This is the trapezoid rule. And this is really what most people do on a first pass of trying to integrate uh, a function is they just apply the trapezoid rule. This is kind of the, it's, it's not the best integration, but it's cheap, it's easy, it's intuitive. Uh, and it actually does a pretty good job because we're essentially averaging the left and the right rectangle rules. Okay, any questions about this so far? It's pretty simple, right? Pretty straightforward. And the formula for this is really, really simple. You just say, okay, I'm going to integrate, I'm going to take one half of, let's say I'm going to say I have delta x over 2. I'm going to have one half of delta x times f of x plus f of x plus delta x. It's that simple. That's my new area trapezoidal, and it's much more accurate. Okay, so there's going to be a couple things I want to do. Um, with numerical differentiation, we talked a lot about error analysis, like how much error do we have with each of the methods. Here, I'm just going to tell you what the errors are, and I'm going to give you kind of a very, very high-level overview of how you would confirm that those are the errors, but we're not going to work through all the details. Okay, You can do that on your own. There's kind of miscellaneous notes uploaded on the website if you want to know how to do this. Um, so for the left and right rectangle, we have two types of error with numerical integration. We have something called local error and something called global error. So any guesses what I mean by local versus global error here? Think about this while I close the door. OK, I'm integrating this function from some left point to some right point with a bunch of little rectangles. So when I say local error, I mean what is the error that I accumulate for every little rectangle that I'm adding up? Right? Every little rectangle has some error associated with it. That's my local error. And my global error is, what's the total error when I add up all of those little errors? Because right, I'm adding up a bunch of little rectangles. So <clears throat> it turns out that for the left and the right rectangle rule, my local error for every little rectangle I add up is like delta x squared. But how many of these little rectangles am I adding up? Like, if I have some function and I have a bunch of little rectangles spaced delta x apart, how many of these little rectangles do I expect to add up? Well, I start at A and I end at B, so my interval is B minus A, and I divide it into delta x little pieces, so divided by delta x. So if I wanted to make my local error smaller, I'd make delta x smaller, right? But as I make delta x smaller, I have more of those little local errors that I'm adding up, one over delta x of them. Right? I have one over delta x of little rectangles I'm adding up. So my global error is order delta x. I'm adding up one over x little rectangles, and each of those one over delta x rectangles has delta x squared error. So I multiply them and I get order delta x global error. So this is no better than finite difference derivatives, right? This is still a pretty poor error scaling. Okay. So trapezoidal integration has a local error uh, of order delta x cubed, which gives me what global error?
delta x squared for exactly the same reason, because I'm adding up 1 over delta x of these local errors. So trapezoidal is a lot better. Right? For the same delta x, I get way more accurate solutions to this integral, because I'm not overshooting or undershooting. I'm kind of averaging out the errors and getting higher order accurate. Make sense? OK. These are really easy to code up, um, especially because there's built-in MATLAB functions to do trapezoidal integration. So there's a command called trap z, trapezoidal. And this is a nice code that does trapezoidal integration. So you should become familiar with it. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I want to tell you about integration. Um, there is another method called Simpson's rule. So how many of you have heard of Simpson's rule before? Yeah, OK. Any, anybody remember how accurate Simpson's rule is? Super duper accurate. It's way, way more accurate than any of the other schemes we'll learn. Um, so again, you could derive this from scratch, but I'm not going to. I really don't want to. Um, so if I have my function, and I have three data points, x1, x2, let's say, sorry, x0, x1, x2, f0, f1, f2. Then I can approximate the integral from uh, x0 to x2 of f of x dx is approximately equal to delta x over 3 f0 plus f plus 4 f1 plus f2. I didn't derive this. I'm just telling you because if you ever come into a problem where you really need a very accurate integrator, this is a super duper accurate integrator. In fact, it's plus order delta x to the fifth over 90 times the fourth derivative of my function at some point. Okay, So this is the thing you'd plug into MATLAB to approximate this. And your error for every little local approximation is, ab is kind of absurdly small, right? Delta x to the fifth over 90. This is a great scaling of error. So this is your local error, and so your global error would be delta x to the fourth. Okay, Way better than trapezoidal. This is built into MATLAB 2 using something called the quad command. How many of you have used quad before? So quad is a really, really cool command, except you don't give it vectors of data. You give it functions. So it's a little bit tricky to use, and maybe we'll do that later in the course. But the quad command does the Simpson rule integration. OK, we're going to code up two examples of integrals using left and right rectangle and trapezoid. And I'm also just going to show you a sketch of how you would predict some of these error terms if you wanted to, or if I asked you to. Okay. Oh, by the way, I posted homework four today. It's due next Friday. Um, it has four problems. They're not super difficult or long, um, but again, like, some of the material will be in the Monday and the Wednesday lecture, so if you have never heard of something before, don't panic. Okay, um, Okay. so we're going to do a numerical integration example. Can everyone in the back see on the screen okay? Yeah? Okay. Uh, so this is just a sketch of how you would approximate what the error is um, for this integral uh, of f of x using like a left or right rectangle. So the basic idea is as follows. So for one of those little rectangles, we're going to integrate from x0 to x0 plus delta x. The true area under that curve for that delta x is the integral of f of x dx. Right? We have some real function that's doing some real stuff in that interval. And if we integrated it, it would be the true area. But we're going to approximate it by just f of x naught times delta x. So what I can do is I can say, well, how different 
I can take my function f of x and I can tailor expand it about that left point, f of x naught. And I can take all of these terms in the Taylor series expansion and I can integrate them out and I essentially get a term that's my left rectangle approximation plus Taylor series error, delta x squared df dx at x naught. That's all I'm going to say about how you compute the error or approximate the error for these integrals. It's very similar to finite difference differentiation. You take a Taylor series, you plug it in at the right place in your integral, you cancel out terms with the thing that you're approximating with, and everything else is error. That's all I'm going to say, unless there's questions. Okay. All right, so let's do some numerical integration. We're going to call this test num int. And the example that we're going to integrate, uh, I think we'll just integrate a sine function. Okay, So we're going to take uh, an interval a equals 0 to b equals 10 with a dx of 0.1. Okay. 0 to 10 increments of 0.1, so it'll be about 100 rectangles, maybe 101. Uh, and then our function, so x is going to be a colon dx colon b. It's a vector from a to b in increments of dx. f is going to be sine of x. Now again, at this point, after line 6, we may interpret this as being purely data driven. There are no functions anymore. There's data vector x and data vector f. Data-driven discovery is one of these buzzwords that you can use to get money from the government. It doesn't mean anything. Um, so data-driven, you'll hear it just come out. Uh, OK, and then I'm going to say n equals the length of x, because I just want to know how many terms in my vector I have. OK, and I can plot, uh, let's say, plot x by f. Cool. I could say stairs x by f, that gives me a little bit of a clearer idea of what we're actually going to be doing. We're going to be adding up all of these little rectangle squares. Let's just go back to plot. Okay, um, so let's just go through left rectangle, right rectangle, trapezoid, then we'll move on. Okay, uh, so left rectangle. So I'm going to have something called area 1, it's going to start out equaling 0. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to step through this function, adding up the areas of rectangles to my area, to area 1. OK, so where do I start? What's the first thing I'm going to do? If I need to add up a bunch of rectangles, for, yeah, for all of the little rectangles in my, in my vector, so 4, i equals 1 to n minus 1. Remember, we're starting on the left side of the integral, so we're going to start at index 1 and go to the end minus 1. And we're going to say area 1 equals area 1 plus uh, dx times f of i. Simple. Super simple. End. Done. Okay, that was the left rectangle integration. We just integrated that. Yeah. Dx times f of x i. Sorry. Isn't that x i? So, again, this f is a vector of data. The first element of f is f of the first element of x. The second element of f is the, I mean, it's f of 2, and that happens to be my function evaluated at x of 2. OK, so I can run that. Uh, let's try right rectangle. Area, let's not call this area 1. Let's call this area left rectangle and area right rectangle. OK, same thing, 4. But what's my new index going to be? Could be 2 to end. I could do 1 to n minus 1. That's fine. But I'd have to take f of i plus 1. So let's just do 4i equals 2 to n, because now we're starting, right? And our, our first rectangle, we're going to measure the point to the right of that x. And we're going to go all the way to the end of the data set. And area rr equals area rr plus dx times f of i. OK, 
because my index now starts one later and ends one later. OK, that was it, right? Rectangle rule, done. Should we be running these and seeing what our answers are? Probably. OK, area left rectangle predicts it's 1.86. Area right rectangle predicts it's 1.81. So they're close, but that's actually pretty bad error, right? That's like 2% error. That's not acceptable. OK, so let's do trapezoidal rule, uh, trapezoidal integration. OK, so what do I do for trapezoidal integration? So n is the length of my whole vector f. How many little rectangles do I have? n minus 1. So I'm going to say, OK, area trap tz equals 0. I'm going to say 4i equals 1 to n minus 1, because I'm going to go through for all of my rectangles. That's how I read this. For all of my rectangles, I want to add up the trapezoidal area of each of those rectangles. Sorry, they're not rectangles. They're dx's. They're trapezoids. For all of my trapezoids, I'm going to add up that trapezoid. Plus, not Texas, tz. OK, what's the area of my trapezoid? What's the area of my ith trapezoid? OK, dx over 2 times. the first rectangle plus the second rectangle, right? The, the first height plus the second height. I've already added, multiplied by dx. So this is f of i plus f of i plus 1, right? OK, and when I run this, I should get uh, area left, le left rectangle, area right rectangle, and then area trapezoid should be what? Somewhere in between. Okay, one point, in fact, it should be almost exactly the average of the two. Not exactly, but almost exactly the average of the two. So, good, that makes sense. It's 1.8375, makes sense. Um, if I wanted to know how well I was doing and how accurate these are, what would I actually do? How would I get more accurate predictions of these integrals? Smaller dx, okay? So let's just make this way, way smaller. dx equals 0 0.001. So this is an incredibly small dx. And so now our area trapezoid, uh, our area left rectangle, area right rectangle, and area trap z should be almost exactly the same. But notice that this is almost exactly what my trapezoidal area was for a dx of 0.1. So my dx of point 0.1 trapezoidal integration was really nailing it. It was doing very, very good, even with a coarse dx, because it's a second order accurate scheme. Okay? Okay, uh, last thing on this example, I should actually tell you the way you would really code this using the function trap z, because that's how you would really do it. So doc trap z. Uh, okay, so. Trap Z, there's two different ways you can call this. You can say trap Z of X comma F, my X points and my function evaluated points. Or I can just give it trap Z of the function evaluated points of F. And this is kind of assuming a fixed delta X. So if I give it trap Z of X comma F, then technically I actually don't need to give it uniformly spaced delta X points because it can compute the area of one trapezoid with a one delta x, the area of another trapezoid with another delta x, and so on and so forth. Does that make sense? These delta x's don't have to be the same for trapezoidal areas. I can compute those trapezoidal areas for any delta x, and as long as I know the x spacing, I know what my delta x is for each of those trapezoids. Okay? So that's the one we're going to use. So we're just going to say uh, area 3, area 4 equals trap z of x comma f. Done. 1.8391. Exactly the same thing we got before. So this is how you would actually do it in MATLAB. This is like trap z. Or you could say area 4 equals dx times trap z of f. If you don't specify x, it just assumes that they're spaced one apart. And so I'm going to multiply it by dx afterwards. Same answer. I 
could do something crazy with the quad command. I could create a spline. Let's see. Area Simpson equals, this might be a disaster, quad of at x spline of, uh, how does my spline work? x in x dummy, x comma f comma x dummy from a to b. I'll put this online. I'm not going to explain what I'm doing. Quad takes in a function, not a vector. I have vectors of data, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a function of a dummy variable x that evaluates a spline that's built on my two data vectors. I have my data x and my data f, and I'm going to build a spline using the spline command. And I'm going to wrap that with a function so that now it's a function of x. If you tell me an x, I'll tell you the spline evaluated on my data at that point x. And now quad can integrate that function from a to b. This will be way more accurate if it doesn't crash. Yes, it works. All right, and it totally nails it. Okay, this is the one line integration. It's fourth order accurate. It's the best thing you can do. Okay, that's all I want to say about integration. I went too far already. Uh, any questions about the code so far? Okay, I expect you to know much, much more about numerical differentiation and numerical simulations of ODEs. These are way more important to me than numerical integration, but this is still important stuff to know. Chances are you'll add up things in your career, and you want to know like the good ways to add things up. Okay. Uh, okay, good. So that's a nice segue into numerical integration of vector fields. Um, so when I say a vector field, how many of you know what I'm talking about? Or how many of you don't know? Raise your hands if, if this is a confusing word, vector field. Vector fields can be confusing. It was a little con it's still confusing. <laughs> Um, so your ordinary differential equation, x dot equals f of x, f of x is a vector field. It gives you a vector, x dot, for every point x that you can evaluate. Okay, so for me, an ordinary differential equation is synonymous with a trajectory in a vector field. It means the same thing. Anytime you hear me say vector field, I mean ODE. Okay? So if I have some x dot equals f of x, then f is a vector field. It literally determines a vector dx dt for every point in space x. This is a field of vectors. Like if you go to a wheat field, it looks like a vector field, and you could integrate like what a particle would do in that vector field. That's an ordinary differential equation. Or you could go to a potential field. Pot fields are great vector fields. OK. Um, in general, f might be really nasty and nonlinear. But oftentimes, we're going to have x dot equals ax. And we should, at this point, know that the solution is e to the at x naught. And we know how to solve this using eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Uh, and we know how to understand the geometry of this linearized differential equation. And so we're interested not in obtaining a numerical solution to our differential equation. We can, we can compute the, uh, the analytic closed form solution for linear systems, but we really can't do anything by hand for these nasty nonlinear systems. We can only do very, very simple things. So in our examples, right, we would take this system and we'd find all of the fixed points, and then we'd linearize about the fixed points, and then we'd solve this for those linearizations. But I was kind of cheating. For most nonlinear differential equations, you can't even solve for the fixed points. This function is so nasty, you don't know when it's 0. Or it's high dimensional, so you don't know when it's 0. This is a really big problem. You don't even know in general, where your fixed points are for a really complex nonlinear ODE. So you can't do any of the things we talked about. The only thing you can do is pick an initial condition x naught and try to see where it goes numerically. 
Okay, so that's what we're going to do for the next uh, four, five lectures. It's today, Friday, the next four lectures. Uh, so we're interested in uh, numerically obtaining a trajectory. So we want x naught, and then we want to know what is x1, x at a, you know, the later time. We want to know x2 and x3 and dot, 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 all the way up to xn. So in my really nasty nonlinear vector field, right, I have all of these vectors. Maybe this is where I live. This is x. And this is my vector field. So for example, maybe this is the fluid velocity field in the Gulf of Mexico, and x naught is where a big blob of oil got dumped. Okay, I should have drawn my vector field in blue and my oil in black. Now my oil is going to be in red. So this is a blob of oil in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. This is a vector field. And by the way, it also depends on time. All of these arrows change in time with wind and with the sun load and with the currents. So really, this whole vector field is changing in time. And this is my little x naught. And what I want to do is numerically find out where it is at x1, and then where it is at x2, and then where it goes at x3. And I want to integrate this trajectory of this oil blob and figure out where it's going to go. Does that make sense? That's what I mean by a vector field. It's a time and spatially varying vector field. It could be really nasty. And the only thing we can do is figure out where trajectories go. And a trajectory is a set of discrete points of where that particle is at different times. X at time 0, X at time 1, time 2, time 3, time n. Okay. OK, and we've already seen how to do this. Uh, I kind of hinted at what we're going to do in the last lecture. We're going to use finite difference approximations for x dot. And we're going to get some kind of an iteration scheme so that if I know x at k at time k, I can tell you what x at time k plus 1 is. OK, let's do that. So this is all based on our finite difference derivatives. Okay. So what is kind of my first reasonable approximation for x dot? Using the finite difference derivatives. What have we been doing in the last class? x dot is approximately, sorry, this is dx dt. So this is x at time t plus delta t minus x at time t divided by delta t. But I'm going to call, um, what I really want is x k dot is going to be x at time k plus 1 minus x at time k divided by delta t. Does everyone see what I did here? Like, I don't want it to be in terms of some generic time. I want, like, I want to evaluate this at discrete points in time, time k, time k plus 1. So I take x at time k plus 1 minus x at time k divided by delta t. That's approximately xk dot, the kth derivative of, sorry, the time derivative of x at time k. And this, based on our differential equation, is equal to f of xk. Right? That's what our differential equation is. x dot equals f of x. And this has to be true at all times k, at all indices k. OK? So we multiply both sides by delta t and add xk. And we get this nice iteration scheme, xk plus 1 equals xk plus delta t times f of xk. This is such an important formula that it's named after one of the greatest mathematicians who ever lived, 
This is called forward Euler. He would probably be embarrassed because this is one of the most unstable and inaccurate schemes to integrate a vector field. But it's also one of the most important because we can really understand everything about this. This is kind of the prototype for analyzing how uh, stable and accurate a numerical method will be. This is how we think about things like stability and error. So stability meaning, does this trajectory do anything like what my actual solution does? And does it get more close as I make delta t smaller? Okay. Um, any questions about what I wrote down here and how I derived it? This is super duper important. I want us to remember this equation. And if x dot equals a times x, so if f of x equals a times x, if my differential equation is linear, then I get a slightly uh, kind of easier version of this. I say xk plus 1 equals xk plus delta t times a xk. And that's the same as identity matrix plus delta t a times xk. xk is just identity matrix times xk. Is it okay with everyone that this x sub k is itself a vector? Right? x could be a vector of all of the things I care about, my position in the oil field in x and y and z. And at every new time k, I have a new x and y and z. Okay, so x itself could be a vector. And this, this forward Euler iteration just tells me if I know my position at time k, I can get my position at the next time k plus 1 by multiplying with this matrix. Identity matrix plus delta t times a. We can program this in MATLAB, and it will follow our solution. This will approximate the actual solution e to the at. So I'm going to box these. These are super important. These are called forward Euler methods. This is kind of general. This is specific for a linear system. Not great stability, not very stable or accurate. But it's a really good prototype because we can really understand everything about this system. We know what the solution is for a linear system. And we can compare that solution with what we get when we iterate this equation. OK. So if I wanted to do something like forward Euler, but I wanted it to be more accurate and more stable, any guesses or thoughts on how I might do that? So I have this type of formula. This is where we started. I could try something like a central difference. Um, turns out that's not going to help me much. Um, actually, that would help you, um, but it's a little complicated. So what we're going to do is instead of using this forward difference, we're going to try to use a backwards difference and get an implicit scheme. So notice that this is entirely explicit, meaning if you give me x at k, I just multiply it by a matrix and I get xk plus 1. This is like exactly what we want numerically because matrix multiplication is easy. The next scheme we're going to come up with is not as nice to implement in a computer, but it's more accurate. Okay, so for this one, what we're going to say is we're going to take xk plus 1 minus xk over delta t. But we're going to say this is equal to xk plus 1 dot. So this is the backward difference scheme at time k plus 1. Right, at time k plus 1, I'm looking backward in time to get my approximation for the derivative. So this is backward difference. 
And that's equal to f of xk plus 1. Now, I still want to solve for xk plus 1 in terms of xk. I still want this iteration so that when I know xk, I can get xk plus 1. And so I'm going to multiply both sides by delta t, add xk. Um, I'm basically going to try to collect all of the xk plus 1s on one side and all of the xks on the other. And so I'm going to get, um, this is kind of a mess. So I get xk plus 1 equals xk plus delta t f of xk plus 1. So this is why I'm calling this implicit, because I still want to solve for xk plus 1. But I don't have all of my xk plus 1s on one side, where if I know xk, I can just multiply it by something and get the answer. I actually would have to solve using some kind of an optimization or some kind of gradient search for xk plus 1 at every time step. So this is an implicit function of xk plus 1. This is called implicit Euler. This one Euler would be happier with, except it's really slow. So this one is better stability, but xk plus 1 is uh, implicit, implicitly defined. Does that make sense, the difference between implicit versus explicit? Like, implicit means it's a pain in the ass to get it. Like, there's no good way of getting xk plus 1 out of this. You have to think really hard to find out the xk plus 1 that solves this equation. Okay? But this has much better error property. Well, not error. It has better stability properties. It's much more stable. For a linear system, you actually can do stuff. So it, for x dot equals ax, we'll do the same thing. We're going to take the special case of a linear dynamics. We're going to say, OK, well, xk plus 1 equals xk plus delta t a x k plus 1. This is still implicit, but now what can I do to solve for x k plus 1? Does it make sense why we want to solve for x k plus 1? Like We have this numerical scheme. I know x naught. And so I want x1 as a function of x0, and I want x2 as a function of x1. I want xk plus 1 as a function of xk. So I'm going to bring all of my xk plus 1s over, and then I'm going to invert whatever matrix is on that side. So I'm going to say, OK, well, this is like an identity minus delta t a times xk plus 1 equals xk. And now I can invert this matrix Sometimes, not always, but oftentimes I can invert this. And I get identity minus delta t a inverse x k. So these are my two implicit Euler schemes. Taking a matrix inverse is not as nice as just multiplying two matrices. Like this is more expensive than just multiplying i plus delta t a by a vector. This is very, very expensive. OK, so I'm not claiming that these are good methods of numerical integration. They are important. They're important because we can directly analyze whether or not they're stable and what their error is for systems that we know the answer to, like x dot equals a times x. And this basic idea of using a finite difference derivative to then cook up an iteration scheme for our, uh, our trajectory, this is the basis of all numerical integration. Okay, So really, really good numerical integrators like ODE45 just find a really fancy formula for xk plus 1 in terms of xk based on very, very similar ideas. OK? So I don't want to go any farther today. I think this is like a lot to take in. In the next lecture, what we're going to do is code these up and see what they do on a spring mass damper system where we know the answer. Then we're going to start taking systems, linear systems, x dot equals ax, where we know the solution. 
and we're going to manually compute when these systems kind of diverge from each other or when they agree and how closely they agree for different delta t's. Before we go, are there any questions? We've got five more minutes. Um, this is an entirely new topic, and this is super important. Like, this is where I want to get with this part of the course is so that you know how to numerically solve ODEs and vector fields. So this is really important. I want any questions you have, like, this would be a great time. Okay, well, happy Halloween. I'll see you all on Monday.